Hello, everybody, and welcome back. So it looks we just had Kevin, so hopefully he comes back uh, while I'm doing these announcements. There he is. Uh, thank you guys so much for your patience tonight um, as we're having uh, Trouble Begins at 6 o'clock instead of Trouble Begins at 5.30 because 5.30 was troubling for us. Um, so again, my name is Jody DeBrine, and I'm the Director of Collections at the Mark Twain House and Museum. Um, I am just going to do some very, very quick admin things before I turn it over to Kevin um, for, so he can tell us how Mark Twain spoke. Um, so first, I want to, of course, thank our sponsors. Uh, uh, this program, the Trouble Begin series, wouldn't be possible without the support of Connecticut Humanities, as well as the Center for Mark Twain Studies in Elmira, New York. So big thank you to both of them for keeping us going. Um, if you would like to support us and the Mark Twain House programs like this and other programs that start on time, um, please click that your support is vital to the Mark Twain House Museum. Please donate here button at the bottom of the screen. It's kind of a tealy color. Um, as we're going through, of course, feel free to continue chatting amongst yourselves. Um, you guys all know how the chat box works for the past half hour. Um, but if you have any questions that you'd like Kevin to answer at the end, please use the ask a question um, feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we'll sure, be sure to try to get to as many as we can at the end of this. So many of you probably know Kevin McDonald. Um, it's my first time meeting him. So thank you, Kevin, for joining us and being patient. Um, he's a late, leading Mark Twain scholar, um, a collector of books, memorabilia. Um, we're so lucky to have you here. And um, I'm gonna head off screen and turn it over to you, Kevin. Well, thank you. Thank you. I thought the trouble was just a joke. We really had trouble for 30 minutes. All of you were saints for being so patient and waiting. I was not so patient. I, uh, there was cursing in the room, I think, at times. I think all of these things, and I'm feeling photogenic, even though I may not look that way. I am wearing pants, and I have a Dr. Pepper to wet my whistle if I... Uh, if I need it, my voice goes dry. I think all of these chats should begin with who cares? Why should we care uh, about uh, whatever it is we're going to talk about? And of course, the chat today is about Mark Twain's voice. So the question I think that we should begin with is why does it matter? Uh, why does it matter what Mark Twain sounded like? And I'm not talking about his literary voice. I'm talking about his physical voice, the physicality, how he sounded. If you met him on the street, talked to him, if you went to one of his lectures, what would he sound like and why does that matter? We don't care what Herman Melville's voice sounded like. We can read Moby Dick and understand it perfectly well without knowing what Herman Melville uh, sounded like. Uh, same thing with Henry David Thoreau or Edgar Allan Poe, uh, with Walt Whitman, or Emily Dickinson. There was a fake tape of Walt Whitman in circulation for a while, but it's now determined to be a, a forgery. And I think sometimes when we hear an author like T.S. Eliot or Flannery O'Connor, we're sometimes disappointed. They don't sound like what we thought they sounded like. They don't sound like that voice we hear in the back of our head when we're reading their books. I think uh, John Milton, for example, probably had an English accent. I can't imagine hearing uh, Paradise Lost in an English accent of mine's thus disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree brought death into the world and all thy woe, all Amy. It just makes no sense to me. Uh, think of Longfellow. We had a Boston accent. So, on the shores of Gitchigumi, by the shining big sea water, ask not what Hiawatha can do for you, but what for you can do for Hiawatha. I think I got that wrong. But you get the idea. Why does it matter? Well, the reason that it matters is because Twain put himself in his works. He's either an active participant or he's a character in many of his works. If you look at all of his travel books, and I have a broad definition of his travel books, not just Innocence Abroad and Tramp Abroad and Following the Equator, but I include Roughing It and Life on the Mississippi in that group. He's in all of them. He is the dominant figure, of course, in his massive autobiography. But he shows up from the very first piece of fiction that he signed his name to, Sugarloaf Mountain, back in Nevada in 1863. He shows up in how I edited an agricultural paper. My first interview with 
Artemis Ward curing a cold. He's in all of his speeches. He's in all of his interviews. He introduces a true story. He, of course, is the central figure in the recent carnival of crime in Connecticut. So I think that Twain is, is in all of his works. We hear his voice. We see him. We can hardly imagine his image without hearing his voice. Clara and Payne, just to cite two examples, thought of Twain primarily by his voice. That's how Clara, his daughter, remembered him when she wrote her book, My Father, Mark Twain. She began on the first page saying that Mark Twain's voice silent, it could not be, and it wasn't. So great a personality can never fade into the state of death. Albert Bigelow Payne was a little more specific and said, not to have heard Mark Twain is to have missed much of the value of his utterance. Many others commented, Howells and others, H.L. Mencken, uh, they all commented on the importance of Mark Twain's voice and how he sounded. He injected his voice into his writings. He injected it into the recent carnival of crime when the little ugly uh, monster, which was his conscience, appeared before him. Uh, Twain had something to say about his voice and he injected it in so that people that had never seen him in a lecture, had never heard him, knew what his voice sounded like. And I'll mention that later. His voice had two qualities. He had a drawl and he spoke very slowly. The drawl sometimes got him in trouble. He got that drawl from his mother. She called it Sammy's long talk. But other people didn't understand it so well. Thomas Bailey Aldrich's wife thought he was drunk, partly because of his drawl and partly because of his posture and partly because he may have been a little tipsy that evening when she met him. Kipling commented on the drawl, and it's worth quoting Kipling, I believe. Kipling called it the long, slow surge of the drawl combined with the deadly, the deadly gravity of the continents. Angelfish Dorothy Quick called it his slow, drawling way. Many other people talked about that drawl. The drawl was characterized by pain in a number of different ways. He called it peculiar, inimitable, exaggerated, gentle, monotonous, and natural. Newspaper reviewers and others used other words to describe the drawl. And it's like they're all talking about a different person. I guess a drawl is in the eye or ear of the beholder. They called it down east, satisfactory, characteristic, fascinating, mechanical, customary, curious, and pathetic. And one guy said it was a deliberate drawl with tens of which tens of thousands will never be able to forget so long as memory has ears. And Laura Hawkins, or Laura Hawkins Frazier, better known as Becky Thatcher, remembered that drawl from their childhood. She said, he had a habit of telling stories in a slow, drawling voice that somehow made you listen. They weren't very good stories. If anyone else had told them, they wouldn't have amounted to anything. But when Samuel told them, they usually sounded quite funny. He had no gift of writing, as far as any of us knew. So there was the drawl. But that drawl could come and go. And Twain used that drawl in certain ways. He could use it to emphasize the point of his humor. And Owen Wister described a perfect example of that. Owen Wister tells the story about Twain talking about it, listening to a minister and being inspired to give a lot of money, put it in the plate. And Wister says that Twain was moved to give 50 cents, but then the preaching continued, and then he was inspired to give a dollar, and then five dollars, and ten dollars, twenty-five dollars, and then to write a big check. And then he said the drawl came in as Twain told this story. And Twain said, and then that preacher went on, said Mark Twain, suddenly whirling on me and coming to a standstill and falling into a drawl. Went on about the dreadful state of those natives. I abandoned the idea of a check. And he went on. And I got back to the five dollars, four, three, two, one. But he went on. And when the plate came around, I took 10 cents out of it. So Owen Wister shows how the drawl was used by Twain to make a very specific point, to emphasize his humor. That drawl could sometimes disappear. 
When Twain was reading before the Browning Society among the, among the young women in Hartford, one of the young women noted that Twain's drawl absolutely disappeared. This is Twain's copy of the Browning with his notes in it. You may be able to see some of his annotations there. And in the margin, he writes a note that says, same voice all through. And I'll let that linger for a second. He was very conscious of his voice and how it sounded. The drawl could also vanish. Clara notes that it vanished when he was in mourning for Susie, cursing the world and cursing existence after Susie died. She noted also that he used it sarcastically when talking to people that annoyed him. So that drawl could come and go. One newspaper reporter said that the drawl disappeared. Another newspaper said the drawl continued, not realizing that Twain was performing for the press, that the drawl was part of that persona. And I, I would not say that the drawl was an artifice. It was natural. He grew up with it. He inherited it from his mother. We have ample witnesses that he spoke in a drawl. But it also would vanish from time to time. So he had control over the drawl, more than I think people uh, generally acknowledge. He also had slow speech. And I think it's interesting to try to figure out just how slow that speech was. Twain himself mentioned the slow speech uh, in an article that he wrote called The First Writing Machines. And he said that his rate of speech was about 100 words per minute. Now, Twain is a notoriously unreliable narrator, so we must question that. We must, it, we would, it would be reasonable to question whether or not Twain really spoke at 100 words per minute. And to go out and try to find evidence, proof that he did that <clears throat> is rather difficult you can go to his notebooks and you can find the programs that he used during the Twain Cable Tour. And during that tour, he records the uh, times that it took him to deliver different parts of the program, but he doesn't always record what piece he was putting into that particular program. And we don't have his revised and marked up text because he didn't read them out of his books. He revised them and um, uh, revised the text for oral presentation, memorized them, he didn't read them out of a book on the, on the lecture stand, and then he um, uh, gave them from memory, but he timed them. Unfortunately, in those books, the Mark Twain Papers has a copy of his um, uh, Huckleberry Finn, I have a copy of the Tauschitz edition of his sketches, he has all kind of markings and revises those texts for his oral readings, but we don't have the times for them. And then on the programs, he had the times reported sometimes, but we don't know exactly what the text was that he read. And you've got to be able to match one to the other. But there is one book that gives us the answer that we need. And that's Mark Twain's own copy of Sketches, Old and New. You can see here, again, I will hold it up and hope that you can, can see some of the revisions that he made. He crossed out a lot of words. He added a lot of text to his speech. And we know from all of these markings on various pages, that the revised form of that sketch, which was how I edited an agricultural paper, was 2,215 words long. And at the beginning, the first page of that sketch, you'll see at the top where he wrote 20 minutes. All it takes is a little simple math, dividing 20 minutes into 2,215 words, and that yields 111 words per minute. That tallies pretty close. That drives with what Mark Twain said himself, 100 words per minute. So now we know he had a drawl. We know he could control the drawl. We know he used it to emphasize his humor. We know it would disappear under some circumstances. We know he would consciously disappear, but other times, like in his grief over Susie, it would just disappear. And we know that he spoke at about 100 words per minute. That still doesn't tell us what his voice sounded like. So where else would we look for the answer to that question? One place we might look would be the people who imitated Mark Twain. And during the 1870s and 80s, when he was active uh, on the stage, he was widely impersonated by both impersonators and elocutionists. And elocutionists would generally go on stage, many of them called themselves professors, very few of them were, and they would go on stage and act out parts from Shakespeare and Dickens and Twain and uh, oh, they do Harriet Beecher Stowe, and they do all kinds of uh, literary artists, some that we've forgotten today. Impersonators, on the other hand, would actually impersonate Dickens or Shakespeare or, or 
Twain. And there were about 2,000 people listed in the census, uh, various censuses in the 19th century, who described themselves as elocutionists or impersonators. If you go through all the old newspapers, you'll find a lot of ads and a lot of them left behind programs. This is a program from Professor Church, who was actually a professor. He was the only professor uh, that I could find who actually was a professor. The other program in here is by a fellow named Alfred P. Burbank. And he's a man who actually met Mark Twain, performed on the platform with Mark Twain on one occasion, and carried on a bit of a correspondence with him. Other impersonators went a little further, and just like Twain had consciously imitated Arnhem's Ward in his appearance, they both had red hair, blue eyes, aquiline noses, a strong jaw. All Twain had to do was grow a bushy mustache and look more like Artemis Ward. Well, here's a dentist who actually looks a little bit like a younger Mark Twain. And if you look closely at the cards at the bottom with all the different the little collage of all the different expressions on his face, you can see that he would imitate Twain among others. He didn't just do Twain. The problem is, um, we don't know which of those uh, smiley faces that circle his portrait. We don't know which one of those is supposed to be Twain. And that's a real shame because that photo, those photographs, this is the earliest photographic documentation we have of what a Mark Twain impersonator actually looked like on stage when he was impersonating Twain. We just don't know which one of those people in that photograph is Twain. This guy's name was Jay Villers. There were others. Here's a grand carnival of authors, has scenes from Uncle Tom's Cabin. It has all kinds of wonderful stuff. Twain is in the small type up here, along with Shakespeare and Dickens, uh, Walter Scott, Twain would have loved that, Tennyson, Longfellow, and others. Very few women uh, were impersonators, but Sadie Joyce Warren was in 1881. She appeared in Madison, Connecticut. She did the membranous group and other Twain, and like many women impersonators and elocutionists, she also served food and played music as part of her program. The men tended not to do that. Not much is known about her. In fact, this broad poster and one census record were all we have for her. There's no record of marriage or death. We don't know where she went, what happened to her after 1881. Another program, very similar to the others, is Laugh and Cry. And it includes Twain again with people like Shakespeare and Dickens. So Twain was in good company. He appeared on some programs, however, never with Jane Austen, but sometimes with Walter Scott, sometimes um, with Bret Hart. That could not have pleased him had he known. And these impersonators, the problem is we know where they perform, when they perform, we know the pieces they performed, but only one of them, a fellow named William Gillette, actually made a recording of his impersonation of Mark Twain. And we will get to that a little later. William Gillette uh, is an interesting character. Uh, he, was a, he later became a famous actor and his role as Sherlock Holmes. He lived in Hartford. He knew Twain. He hung out in the household. Livy thought he was a handsome devil. Kate Leary uh, thought he was absolutely, you know, God's gift to women. And uh, his nickname was The Ladder because he was so tall. And he grew up right there in Nook Farm and spent a lot of time in the house. And he was also known as a very good mimic. But we'll get to him a little later. The other place that we might look is in the recordings that Twain made himself. Twain was recorded on at least six occasions that can be verified. The first occasion was in May of 1888 when he went to the New York office on Bay Street of Thomas Edison. And he missed Thomas Edison. Edison wasn't there, so Twain stayed there for an hour and a half and played around and made some recordings on wax cylinders. And I should make a note about wax cylinders. They are extremely delicate. They're wax, they mold, they dry out, they chip, they break. There's even a video on YouTube of a guy holding one when it suddenly just explodes in his hand. He doesn't squeeze it or manipulate it. He's just holding it and it just shatters. They are more delicate than spun glass they rarely ever survive at all. So even if someone put one away and carefully preserved it, uh, wax cylinders are very rare. And they weren't made to be permanent. They were made on, they were soft wax. They look just like what people call glass cylinders, which aren't really glass, they're celluloid. 
but a wax cylinder is soft. And it was designed just like a cassette tape for you to be able to erase it and re-record. And a wax cylinder, you could run it through your machine and shave it smooth and then record on it again. And then shave it smooth and then record on it again. It was used in business for dictating letters, things like that. So the wax cylinders that Twain recorded on were never intended as anything more than an ephemeral way of recording your voice for an ex you know, a specific purpose for a short period of time. Twain then went back to Edison's lab and record in the company of a fellow named George Isles, who was a, a man, uh, an editor from Canada that Twain befriended. And they spent some time at his lab in New Jersey, and Twain again recorded some things for Edison. So what happened to those recordings? They burned up in the Edison fire about 1913, 1914. We know this because Edison wrote a letter to Cyril Clemens in 1927, and who would know better than Thomas Edison himself, saying those recordings burned up. We can hope that maybe the recordings made in New York survived elsewhere and weren't in the lab at that time, but that's unlikely. It's a possibility. Some time ago, some, some of the recordings on wax cylinders were discovered back in, I guess, in the 1950s in Edison's home, and they were not playable. If you put a needle to a wax recording, you destroy the, the recording. So they put them away until the technology could catch up. And they later, about 10 years ago, had the technology. They used, I think, a laser to map the grooves. And then they put that in a computer. They generated a digital uh, recording from that map and then played it back and got what was on those tapes. Mark Twain was not among them. And they haven't found any other since. So those, those recordings were very likely lost. The next time that Twain <clears throat> recorded his voice was in May and March and April, I'm sorry, March and April of 1891 when he was writing The American Claimant. He had wanted to record uh, and dictate uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, but he was unable to get a machine and the details didn't work out. But he did get a machine, the guy showed up with it, showed him how to use it, had to replace the battery, they got it working, and they sent him six dozen blank wax cylinders. Twain sat down in two sessions and filled up four dozen of those cylinders. And then he gave up. He said recording into a dead machine was just too difficult, that he needed to have an audience, he needed to have a reaction, he needed to have flesh and blood there to, 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 that would react to what he was saying. It was just too hard speaking into a machine and be creative. He said it might be fine for dictating letters, but he didn't even use it for that at that time. And he gave up. We don't know what happened to those. I have searched the uh, attics and basements. Uh, the basement, the cellar at Stormfield survives. It was not burned. The house above it did, but not the, the cellar. I've searched uh, Quarry Farm. I've searched other places. I've uh, spent a lot of time looking for those. They're lost, and there's no reason to think they weren't shaved over, reused, or thrown away. And even if they were kept, uh, uh, and there was one person who thought they might have been in a bank vault, that bank vault was probably open, and by that time they would have been dried out, and people would have known what was on them, and they would have been thrown away. The next time he was recorded was in December of 1893. A man named Gianni Battini was a man from Italy and came to New York, married an American woman. He was quite wealthy, and he opened up a salon on Fifth Avenue, a recording salon. He invented his own phonograph. He was a competitor of Gramophone and Edison and others, but he also made um, uh, supplies that could be used with all of his competitors' uh, phonographs. And an opera star named Nellie Melba was recording in his studio one day when Twain visited the studio, and Twain interrupted her recording and talked about his own experience recording. And we know this from a, an article written in a magazine in 1896 for audiophiles by a reporter who listened to that recording. And I have now listened to all of the known recordings of Nellie Melba. I was never an opera fan to start with, and that didn't, that didn't change me or improve me. I'm still not, despite a musical background. So Nellie Melba's recording of Mark Twain is apparently lost. And we think we know what happened to it. There used to be a rumor that there was a collector in France uh, who was captured by the Nazis and all of his possessions destroyed or, or uh, taken into uh, Nazi possession. And I think that rumor may be connected to uh, Gianni Bettini. He was not captured by the Nazis, but he was living in France in 1938 when he died. And his recordings and his equipment were stored uh, a little in a little village outside of Paris, 
And World War II came along and Allied bombers bombed that storage facility and destroyed Gianni Bettini's possessions. So we know what happened to that recording. The next time Twain recorded is pretty well documented because we have the letter and the letter is right here. The letter is in the hand, except for the signature, it's in the hand of Isabel Lyon. And in the P.S. at the bottom of the letter, you probably can't read it, but I'll read it to you. It says, P.S. This is my first experiment in dictating a letter to a gramophone, and I am thoroughly delighted with it. I shall never use the slow and tedious pen again. Now, that was a lie. Twain used a pen the next month and started writing his letters, and he would occasionally dictate letters, but he began using a pen again right away. But he dictated that letter to Isabel Lyne in November of 1905. A short time later, in January of 1906, came the last time that we can document when Twain recorded his voice. His 70th birthday speech was recorded. It wasn't recorded at the event. That's the menu for the event. You get an idea of the dinner at Delmonico's where all of the people associated with Harper Brothers showed up. Pardon me just a second. We'll deal with that later. Um, in January of 1906, uh, he recorded the, the 70th birthday uh, uh, speech, and Isabel Lyon listened to it and said that it was very, very sad that to listen to a recording and imagine what it would be like to listen to a recording by somebody after they are dead. So you wonder uh, if that might reflect some of Twain's thoughts about it. That recording, too, is lost. There's reason to believe that it was shaved and may have been reused to dictate letters later on. There's some evidence of that, and I won't go into all of that. So that brings us, and that was not the last time, by the way, that Twain was associated with recording devices. A company started marketing what looks a lot like a CD. You can see right there somebody's hand holding what looks like a compact disc putting in a mailing envelope, and that's exactly what they're doing. And this is 1907, and they used Twain to advertise their CD. They called it Frozen Speech, a blow to Mark Twain. Except that Mark Twain never recorded on a CD. This company went out of business in the 1920s after selling about 500 machines, and as we all know, that was the end of CDs in America. So it's ironic that Twain uh, was used to advertise a recording device, but not wax cylinders, not anything that he actually used, but for CDs that actually recorded magnetically. They were designed to record phone calls. And that, um, that particular recording, um, you know, uh, or that device only lasted into the 1920s and then they went out of, out of business. So it's ironic that Twain, who loved gadgets like that, uh, would have been exploited to advertise such a gadget that he never actually used. I have no doubt if he had known about those, he probably would have used them. And that brings us to the William Gillette recording. William Gillette will we'll play that recording very briefly so that you have an idea of how William Gillette sounded. Oh, 
Walker's wife lived very new on me for a long time. They weren't going to see that. But one day, the parson called in kind of lively like him. One of the boys said, well, how's the wife? Parson, he said, well, she's considerable better, thanks the Lord, for his infinite mercy. And with the help of Providence, she said, well, yes. Yeah. Well, I bet you two to one. She don't anyhow. Just a smile in before he started. There are two versions of the Gillette recording, which was made by Professor Packard at Harvard in the 1930s. That's the unedited version made from the original, uh, well, not the original copy, but the earliest copy that survives at Yale. There's another version, which you can hear on YouTube, that is at East Lansing at University of Michigan. It's edited. It is an edited version from this copy. But it is from that copy. I've compared them on an oscilloscope, which is like a voice recording or a fingerprint. They are the same recording. It's just somebody edited out the flubs and added some notes to the one that's in Michigan. For many time, for many years, people thought there were that one of them might actually be Twain, but it isn't. Here's the thing we know about Gillette. We know that Gillette performed in front of Mark Twain. We know that uh, Twain was present in the audience and heard Gillette. That's generally known. That occurred in 1877. What isn't generally known is that Twain came up to Gillette later and made a comment. When Gillette was giving a speech at, the, uh, at a club in Hartford in 1930, he was going over the high points in his career, and he mentioned this, and he said that when he uh, got through, that Twain came up to him and said that his performance, his impersonation of Twain, had given him, and I quote, one more reason for being sorry I was born. That may not sound like a compliment, but it was a Twainian compliment. And Gillette took it as such. Gillette performed many, many times. He, here's a letter by Gillette offering to perform in 1935. How Holbrook used that recording as his model. How Holbrook visited Isabel Lyon. He visited Ben Pond. He met Madame Charbonnel. Keep in mind that many of the people that heard Gillette, heard how Holbrook performed in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, were people who had heard Mark Twain, who were alive, and had met Mark Twain, who knew what Mark Twain sounded like. So we have Hal Holbrook's letter to Isabel Lyon thanking her for visiting with him. I think Hal Holbrook's association with Mark Twain may go back even earlier. Holbrook was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and in 1872, Twain visited the Cleveland Club, and he signed their register. And if you look closely, you'll see Samuel Clemens of Hartford signing the register, and right above it, you'll see the signature of a Harry Holbrook. That's positively spooky. Some may quibble about the date, but I say the association could be earlier than we ever imagined. What all of this means is that Twain heard Gillette and gave Gillette his blessing. Holbrook modeled after Gillette. So we have a direct link between Twain and Holbrook. And keep in mind that Twain is a fictitious character. He's invented by Samuel Clemens. Samuel Clemens performed as Mark Twain from 1863 to 1910 for 47 years. Holbrook first began doing uh, Mark Twain in 1949 when he was touring with his wife going to various high schools, long before he did Mark Twain Tonight. And he retired in 2017, so Hal has been Mark Twain for 68 years compared to Samuel Clemens' performance of that character for 47 years. So we have to remember that Mark Twain is a fiction. He's a personality. He's a fabrication by Samuel Clemens, a character, a fictional character, just like Hamlet, except that Hamlet only carries the burden of the character of Hamlet. Mark Twain carries the burden of all of the works that Samuel Clemens wrote the entire body of that literature. And I think that for that reason, that's why it's important to know what Sam, Samuel Clemens, what Mark Twain sounded like. And I think because of that direct link, we have a pretty good idea of what Mark Twain sounded like. And I speculate in my article in the Mark Twain Journal, which I encourage anyone to get a hold of on JSTOR or from the Mark Twain Journal and read, that if somebody were to, if somebody were to find an original recording of Mark Twain today, he would probably end up sounding like some damn fool trying to imitate Hal Holbrook. And with that, I will entertain questions if Jody wants to come back.
and uh, see what questions any of you may have. Hi, thank you so much. That was so great. I don't think I've seen a tape recorder like that in a while. <laughs> I have to use a tape recorder instead of a CD uh, because the CD didn't capture the total quality as well as the original cassette, which yep. I got Yale back in the 1970s. So I deliberately did use my old yeah. tape recorder in the original cassette. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one of those things I you know, working in museums, there's always the, the old versions of technology and sometimes you have to go back to them. They're the they're the best, you know, once you manipulate it multiple times to to re to digitize it, it, it loses part of it. So um no, I think that was great. Now, um I wanted to mention also that Dr. Pepper paid a huge fee for product placement here. <laughs> and that um it's like the Mississippi River water that Mark Twain described is fine for steamboating. It's great to drink. Not much good for anything else except baptisms. And of course, <laughs> most people probably know that this is Mark Twain's desk behind me. The statue that you see back here uh, is the statue that stood on his mantle at Quarry Farm in the study. And most of the things here are possessions of Mark Twain. And the Dr. Pepper can was empty, just a prop. I'll baptize myself. There's nothing <laughs> there. uh, I did that for the benefit of your staff to see if I could lure them into saying anything not nice because I think any jerk that spills a soft drink on Mark Twain's desk should be whipped. <laughs> I just thought that might hold some interest for your, for your staff. Uh, That's appreciate, awesome. the, appreciate the work they do and just decided I would uh, yank the chain. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, so we did have a poll um, of have you ever seen Hal Holbrook portray Mark Twain? Um, and we had 39 people vote. So 30 people said yes. And nine people said no. So um, that's an interesting little statistic there for you. Um, mm -hmm. I was one of the no votes. I have not heard him portray Mark Twain yet. Um, but we do have some questions rolling in. So um, the first one um, from Joe says, do you have any examples of printed ephemera that might conceivably have been worked upon while Clemens was a young printer's apprentice in Hannibal? I have the Hannibal directory where Twain, uh, uh, where Clemens worked on at the time he left Hannibal. I have a number of examples of printing from the Ben Franklin print shop uh, in Keokuk, but nothing from Hannibal. I'm sorry, not the Hannibal, it's the Keokuk directory. I have nothing from Hannibal, but I do have uh, examples of printing from Orion Clemens print shop, um, a deed document from the Ben Franklin print shop that were done in 18. 55 and 56 when, when uh, Clemens was working in his brother's print shop. And I also have a small selection of books that I've been able to track down that were printed at Parker's printing establishment in New York City in 1852 when Twain was in New York City working at Parker's uh, printing establishment. And these are all books that were printed in those months or about the same time that Twain was working there, some of which Twain even mentions uh, that he worked on some periodicals and things. So I that is a an area of Twain's uh, life that I have collected things on, have watched for things, but it's very difficult, as you might imagine, those things are few and far between. Yeah, yeah. So this is an interesting one. So you've been talking about how he spoke. Um, do you have anything that can describe how Twain might have laughed? No, I can't think of anything that describes his laughter. There's a great picture of him sitting in a boat in Bermuda with a big grin on his face. And you know, 19th century people did not like to be photographed laughing or smiling. They thought the wrinkles in the face was undignified. And I think Twain certainly felt that way. He always kept that very somber look on his face, almost a scowl. And um, so I think he deliberately did not uh, laugh. And I think on stage, it would have been easy for him to hide his laughter. Uh, I sat almost in the very front row when Hal Holbrook performed in Elmira. And Hal would laugh every once in a while when he got a zinger out there and the audience cracked up, but you couldn't tell unless you were sitting right up front looking up at him because it was up under his mustache and you could kind of see him chuckling to himself. But somebody sitting just a few rows further out would not have detected that, nor would they have smelled the stinky cigar that Hal was actually smoking on the stage. And so uh, I don't know of any descriptions of his laughter, but if you look at the article that I wrote in the Mark Twain Journal, I cite all of the reviews that I found that pertain to the impersonators that I could document. And they describe his voice and his performances. 
I just can't remember any of it described as laughter. I don't remember pain, anything in the autobiography, nothing that I can remember that described as laughter. Great. Um, so uh, John Pascal uh, said that he missed it, but he's uh, wondering if you could say again what happened to the cylinder of the 70th birthday speech of January 1906. We don't specifically know, and it didn't end up in the estate of Clara Clemens. It didn't end up in a certain bank vault where it was thought that it might have survived with some others. Um, I've checked all of the logical places where it would have descended. I know the people... I know what things Claire retained, like Mark Twain's inkwell, which is sitting here behind me. And of course, the desk was sold in her 1951 sale. This she kept till the day she died, along with some other things that I have. And uh, they passed a woman named Phyllis Harrington, and they passed from her to Phyllis Harrington's friend. They did not include a wax cylinder or any kinds of recordings. And I think that if a recording like that had survived, Clara would have been the person most likely to have had it. Uh, Frank Whitmore, uh, Twain's business manager in Hartford, uh, thought that some of the recordings of the American claimant might have, might have survived in a bank vault in New York City. That bank vault presumably was opened at some point to settle the estate. I would assume that anything, any wax cylinders probably would have been thrown out at that time or, or else preserved and given to Clara, but there's no evidence of that. So every place is a dead end. I, I, I chased, excuse me, all over Hungary where Twain recorded. I think I may have left that out. He recorded in, in Hungary uh, in 1899 for the Otwan Club. Uh, I think that's when I skipped, in fact. And um, I actually, I found the president of that club, the secretary of the club, the club itself, some associated clubs. I then contacted every library in Hungary, the state library, public libraries, institutional libraries, and asked about the president of the club and the secretary of the club, the club itself, and all the other associated clubs, and they had nothing. No archives survived. That was not surprising given World War II and the devastation in Hungary. So I've gone, uh, both as a collector and as a scholar, I have, I have looked down every avenue I can think of to trace any voice recordings of Mark Twain and have run into dead ends everywhere. Uh, it's not clear what happened to the 70th birthday speech. I did go to the Harper archives. I contacted the descendants of George Harvey, thinking, well, he was at the dinner, maybe Twain did the recording and gave it to George Harvey, who, uh, you know, sponsored the birthday dinner where he gave the speech. I thought of all the angles I could, and, and again, dead end after dead end. But keep in mind, even if a wax recording did survive, <clears throat> the odds of it being playable or recoverable are, are very slim. Um, so one of our guests says that they didn't realize the extent of Gillette's interest in intimate uh, Twain. Uh, when was Gillette's last Twain performance? Do we know? Probably uh, the recording that he did with Packard. Um, the date given usually is 1933 or 34, but there's an internal clue in Packard's own account that makes that date questionable. And so the date that I have is a little later, and I believe it is 1936. Yeah, um, Professor Packard at Yale, I'm sorry, at Harvard, uh, said that he had seen a performance of a play called Three Wise Fools, and that he, Gillette, was in that play, and that he had him record uh, his performance of The Jumping Frog after the play that night. And most people think that recording was in 1933 or four, but I found that Three Wise Fools uh, didn't, Gillette wasn't performing it in 1933 or 34, he was performing it in 1936. So that pretty well, unless Professor Packard is misremembering the play that he saw, and I don't think he would misremember that, uh, the recording is probably 1936, and Gillette died very shortly after that. There's another account that he gave, a re did a recording in 1922. I have a letter that he's written to a club in Connecticut where he was offering in 1935 to do a uh, performance of it. And I believe he also in 1935 did a performance for it, uh, either in New York City or possibly in Hartford, uh, where they were having a big dinner celebrating the centennial of Mark Twain's birth. So he did numerous recordings, but the recording that survives, there's one original, which I've played for you. There's the copy at Michigan that's edited, and all of the others are what I'd call the Gillette diaspora. 
Those are all re-recordings of this original recording. Uh, I've put them on the oscilloscope and looked at them. It's like a fingerprint, like doing DNA sequencing. They are the same recording. So that's fascinating. Um, that's awesome. Um, okay, so Taylor says, do you have any comments about the speed at which Clemens spoke his autobiographical dictations? I'm always amazed that he seemingly dictated them so grammatically and thoughtfully. Well, Twain was a brilliant writer. He was extremely well read. I think most writers will tell you if you want to write well, read. Read like crazy. The more you read, the better you will write. I think the more that you write, the better you can speak. As a public speaker, I think you can come up with some pretty good grammar and good diction uh, if you do that. And by the time that Twain was dictating his autobiography in 1905, six, seven, in those years, he, he had been writing and lecturing in public uh, for decades. And so it's not a surprise to me that the diction would be that good, but keep in mind too, that he was speaking at 100 words a minute, you're speaking at about two thirds the normal rate of speech. Also keep in mind, you're not talking like a metronome. It's not click, 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 click. He paused, sometimes for effect. He would stumble. You hear Gillette replicating that when Twain would flood and he would, would cover himself. So I think, I think that 100 words per minute gives you a little extra time to think about your words, organize your thoughts, get your grammar correct, and uh, your word choices. But keep in mind too, that he had typescripts. And once his secretary, Miss Hobby, or Payne, or Isabel Lyon, whoever was taking the dictation that day, when they had the uh, typescript prepared, they gave it back to Twain, and Twain could revise them and mark them. The Mark Twain papers have uh, a lot of those uh, typescripts. And, and so Twain was able to edit uh, himself. That's great. All right, so I think we have one more. I may, there's some comments and things in the questions as well, but um, any thoughts on Twain and Omar, and I'm gonna butcher this last name, so I very apologize for that, but Kayam, it's K-H-A-Y-Y-A-M. Omar Kayam. Kayam, okay. Well, that's the Persian poet, and uh, he wrote the Rubiot. And mm -hmm. Al Griffin and I, many, many years ago, edited the Ruby out of Omar Khayyam that was written by Twain. It's a Twain's kind of satiric take on the original poem, which is about aging and youth, the contrast of aging and youth. So I think the context for interpreting the Ruby out um, that Twain wrote, which is a, it's quatrains, I forget how many, 50 quatrains, it's, it's verse. And Twain wrote a lot of poetry. And... I think the context for understanding that is in the context of what is man and uh, the 70th birthday speech where he talks about reaching the age of 70 by his own route. And that if you took his route, it might kill you or kill another man, but his route worked for him. And I, so I think that, and there's a good chapter on it, by the way, I'll give a plug for the book that Kent Rasmussen and I edited, Mark Twain and Youth. There's an excellent essay in there on uh, Mark Twain and uh, youth and old age. And so I think the, uh, the Omar Khayyam for Twain was kind of a touchstone, a uh, point of departure to write a poem uh, contemplating uh, youth and old age. Um, and one more, came, last one came in, so we'll finish, finish up with this one um, so that we can end at seven. But um, is there any thought that Isabel Lyon might have taken any cylinders to her death? I was in touch with one descendant of Isabel Lyon I acquired some material um, that, that belonged to Isabel Lyon, and I've talked to other people who acquired material that belonged to Isabel Lyon from various sources. And there's no evidence of those recordings uh, being part of Isabel Lyon's estate. I also think that if Isabel Lyon had had a recording of Twain, that she might have shared that with Hal Holbrook when he visited, and there's no mention of that. I can't imagine that she would have sat on a tape. She, she took a swig of whiskey, lit a cigar, and sat there and held forth and told Hal everything that she knew, including things that Hal swore to secrecy that he would never tell. I wish I knew what those were. Yeah. But, uh, and he doesn't mention them in the letter to Isabel Lyon, which came from Isabel Lyon's estate, too. And I have her angel fish pen. I have some other things that belong to her, some books from her library. So the, um, 
but no recordings from Isabel Lyons' estate. And, I, and I'm pretty strong in the belief that if she had had any, uh, she probably would have played them uh, for Hal Holbrook. And keep in mind, Isabel Lyons had the idea, she recorded in her journal, that listening to a recording of someone who has died, she imagined would be a very sad thing. It really made her sad to think about that when Twain was recording his 70th birthday speech. And I know that many of her diary entries reflected her conversations with Twain. And so I think it's reasonable to assume that that um, um, observation by Isabel Lyon may also reflect an observation by Twain himself, that recording your voice uh, might be a sad thing for descendants or relatives to listen to, which would have been more and more reason not to preserve them. Uh, just don't know. The, the, base, the bottom line on all of this is when it comes to recordings and what happened to them and where they would be is we just don't freaking know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on that note, thank you so much, Kevin, for coming and giving your presentation and sticking with us through all the tech troubles for this trouble um, program. And uh, it's been such a pleasure. I've learned so much. I'm sure our audience has. Um, I will keep an eye on the chat and things over the next couple of days. So if there's any other questions that um, we need to send your way to get answers, to, we'll, we'll do that. Um, but to all the audience, thank you for sticking with us. Um, obviously, we ran a little bit later than normal just because we started a little bit later. But um, thank you all again. Um, I want to make sure everybody is aware that November 6th, Friday, November 6th, is the Mark Twain House uh, Museum Gala. It starts at 8 p.m. Um, all the information is on our website. Uh, please register. It is free to attend. It's going to be an hour of really great programming. Grab your Dr. Pepper and, you know, come and join us. So uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody in the audience. And we'll see you next time. It was a pleasure. Thank you.